It was at that moment that the first gang member started pulling indiscriminately on the trigger on his gun, even though I was still gripping his wrist. Gunshots boomed, bullets shredded the walls. I had to do something, so pushing my feet off from the door frame, I hurled us both to the floor. We tumbled to the ground together, a clumsy rolling heap, so clumsy in fact that the youth's gun was pushed awkwardly up against his own head, and then... And then, abruptly, shockingly, the gun had gone off and the youth's head had simply exploded. Swain didn't need to listen to Dixon any more. He could see it all in his mind's eye as if he was still there. He could remember the star of blood that had sprayed all over the door. He could still feel the youth's body go limp against his own. Dixon was still reading the statement. As soon as the other gang members saw their dead comrade, they fled. I believe it was about then that I passed out. This statement is dated 3-10-00, 155 AM, signed Stephen Swain, M.D. Dixon looked up from the sheet of paper. Swain sighed. That's it. That's my statement. Good. Dixon handed the typewritten statement to Swain. If you just sign there where it says consent granted, that'll just about do it, Dr. Swain. Oh, and may I say once again, on behalf of the New York Police Department, thank you. Status check. Grid coordinates of Labyrinth to be transmitted to all systems upon electrification. We'll see you in the morning, then, Officer Paul Hawkins said as he stood inside the enormous translucent glass doors of the New York State Library. See you, then, the lieutenant said, closing the doors on Hawkins' face. Hawkins stepped away from the doors and nodded to his partner, Parker, who stepped forward with a large ring of keys. As Parker began to bolt the first of four locks on the huge translucent doors, Hawkins could see the blurred outline of the lieutenant affixing bright yellow police tape across the entrance. The tape pressed up against the other side of the glass, and Hawkins could make out the familiar words, Police line, do not cross. He checked his watch. 5.15 p.m. Not bad, he thought. It had only taken them twenty minutes to skirt the building and seal off all the entrances and exits. Parker finished off the last lock and turned around. All done, she said. Hawkins thought about what the other cops had said about Christine Parker. Three years his senior, she was hardly pretty, for that matter, hardly petite. Big hands, dark, heavy-set features, good with a gun. Unfortunately, her image hadn't been helped along by reports of insensitivity. She was known in the department for her rather icy demeanor. Hawkins shrugged it off. If she could hold her own, that was all that mattered to him. Good. He turned to face the enormous atrium of the library. Do you know what happened? I was only called in this afternoon. Somebody broke in and slashed up a security guard. Pretty messy, Parker replied casually. Broke in? Hawkins frowned. I didn't see any forced entry on any of the doors we sealed. Status check. Zero, forty-four, sixteen, to electrification. Parker put her keys in her pocket and shrugged. Don't ask me. All I know is that they haven't determined point of entry yet. SID's coming in tomorrow morning to do that. Guy probably picked the lock on one of the storage doors. Those things have got to be at least 40 years old. She cocked her head indifferently. Larry at dispatch told me they spent most of the day just trying to clean it all up. Parker walked over to the information desk and sat down. Anyhow, she put her feet up on the counter. This isn't so bad. Doesn't bother me if I get double time for sitting in a library all night. Come on, Daddy. Holly said impatiently. I'm missing Pokemon. Okay, okay. Swain pushed open the front door. Holly burst past him, dashed into the house. Swain pulled his key from the door and called after her. Don't slide on the carpet. He stepped inside as Holly charged out of the kitchen, biscuit tin in one hand, a can of Coke in the other. Swain stopped in his tracks as Holly cut across his path, making a beeline for the TV. Watching her, Swain put his suitcase down, folded his arms, and leaned against the bench that separated the kitchen from the living room. 
He watched as, unsurprisingly, in mid-stride, Holly dropped to the floor and slid gracefully across the carpet, coming to a halt inches away from the television set. Hey! Holly gave him a throwaway smile. Sorry! She flicked on the TV. Swain shook his head as he went into the kitchen. He always said not to slide on the carpet, and Holly always did it anyway. It was kind of a ritual. Besides, he thought, Helen had always said it, and Holly had always ignored her, too. It was a good way for both of them to remember her. It had been two years now since Swain's wife had been killed by a drunk driver who had tried to run a red light at fifty miles an hour. It had happened late one August evening, around 11.30. They had run out of milk, so Helen had decided to walk to the 7-Eleven a few blocks away. She never came back. Later that night, Swain would see her body at the morgue. The mere sight of it, bloodied and broken, had knocked the wind out of him. All the life, the essence, the personality, everything that had made her Helen, had been sucked from it. Her eyes had been wide open, staring blankly into space, lifeless. Death had struck, brutally, swiftly, unexpectedly. She had gone out for milk, and then all of a sudden she was gone. Just gone. And now it was just him and Holly, somehow continuing life without her. Even now, two years on, Swain occasionally found himself staring out the window, thinking about her, tears forming in his eyes. Swain opened the fridge, pulled out a Coke for himself. As he did so, the phone rang. It was Jim Wilson. You missed a great game. Swain sighed. Oh, yes. Man, you should have seen it. It went into... No, stop, don't tell me. Wilson laughed loudly on the other end of the line. Now, would I do that? Not if you wanted to live. Want to come over and watch it all over again? Sure, why not? I'll be there in ten, Wilson said, and hung up. Status check, zero, 01438 to electrification. Swain glanced at the microwave. The green LED clock read 5.45 p.m. He looked over at Holly, camped less than a foot away from the television screen. On the screen, multicolored creatures danced about. Swain grabbed his drink and went into the living room. What are you watching? Holly didn't move her eyes from the screen. Pokemon, she said, feeling for the biscuit tin beside her and grabbing a biscuit from it. Any good? She turned quickly, scrunched up her nose. Nah, Mew isn't there today. I'll see what's on the other channels. No, wait. Swine leaned forward, grabbing for the remote. The sport will be... The station changed, and a newsreader appeared on the screen. While in football, fans in the national capital were not to be disappointed as the Redskins scalped the Giants 24-21 to in an overtime thriller. At the same time, in Dallas... Swain closed his eyes as he sank back into his chair. Oh, man. Did you hear that, Daddy? Washington won. Grandpa will like that. He lives in Washington. Swain laughed softly. Yes, honey, I heard. I heard. Status check. Officials attending to Earth contestant await special instructions regarding teleportation. Paul Hawkins strolled idly around the foyer of the library. His every footfall echoed hauntingly in the open space of the atrium. He stopped to survey the atrium around him. It was, quite simply, a massive interior space. When one took into account the rail-lined balcony that ran in a horseshoe above the lower floor, its ceiling was actually two stories high. In the early evening darkness, the atrium looked almost cavernous. Ten-foot-high bookcases loomed in the brooding semi-darkness. Indeed, with the onset of night, apart from the harsh white glow coming from the information desk where Parker sat reading, the only light that penetrated the gigantic room was the slanting blue light from the streetlights outside. Status check. Zero, zero, three, zero, four to electrification. Teleport officials, stand by. Hawkins looked over at Parker. She was still sitting behind the information desk, her feet up, reading some Latin book she said she'd read back in school. 
Jesus, it's quiet here, he thought. Status check. 00141 to electrification. Status check. Officials on Earth confirm receipt of special instructions. Stand by. <laughs>